One of the major advantages of testing hormones in urine is the availability of testing metabolites that are not otherwise available. So for example with the estrogens, and this is particularly true with estrogens, when we're testing estrogen levels we usually start with estradiol. That's the primary most potent estrogen. So if you want to test estrogen you start with that. And in blood, in saliva, and in urine you can test those things. So for this particular woman, you know, in urine the reference range here is 2 to 4.9 and she's at 8.2. So if you tested this woman in saliva, in urine, or in blood, you're probably going to get a pretty high level. She's got a lot of estrogen dominant symptoms. Um, and so that's where we kind of start. To get a better idea, we can add in the other primary estrogen, so estrone and estriol. And you can see in this case, they tell the same story. Lots of estrogen. These are all uh, very high relative to the reference range and so that's where we start with the estrogens but then there's more to it than that it's not just a matter of how much estrogen do you make but also a matter of what does your body do with it because the, there are three main metabolism uh, pathways for this estrogen to go down and they are going to be different and different women will metabolize them differently so we've got three estrogens 16 hydroxyestrone 4-hydroxyestrone and 2-hydroxyestrone. And both estradiol and estrone will go down these three pathways. And so what we want to do is, in addition to looking at how much estrogen you make, we want to look at the relative distribution of the metabolism. So if you look at what's normal or expected, it's about 71% of the 2-hydroxy pathway and 9% of the 4-hydroxy pathway, so you can see that here, and about 22% of the 16-hydroxy pathway. And so for this particular woman, you can see that her 2-hydroxy pathway that makes this uh, cancer-protective 2-hydroxy estrogen is a lot less. You can look at that green piece of the pie here, is a lot less for this particular woman than what's expected, whereas the 4-hydroxyestrogen is higher than what's expected, as is the 16-hydroxyestrogen. So that's not a very favorable pathway, or profile rather. And so once we make those hydroxyestrogens in a different relative amounts, then we can also process those further by methylation. So two hydroxyestrogens are methylated, so you can see that here, to create 2-methoxy-E1. And you can see for this particular person that the methylation activity is relatively high, so that's a good protective uh, step that we want to see functioning well to protect people from things related to the bad estrogen metabolites. So one, we want to favor this pathway here, and how do we do that? that's where things like DIM come in. So women and men will make more of 2-hydroxyestrogens if they simply eat more cruciferous vegetables because there is a substance in there called indole-3-carbonyl, sometimes called I3C. So indole-3-carbonyl gets metabolized to di indole methane and that's really what upregulates this 2-hydroxy pathway so women can take supplements to help a pattern like this and for this particular woman that would be a good idea because she wants to make more of those so-called good estrogens. The other thing that's going to do is as you upregulate this pathway you're going to take these estrogens, estrone and estradiol, and those will come down a little bit. So it's a twofold benefit for a woman like this to make less of these primary estrogens that she just has too much of, and to also be making more of the favorable metabolites. And then again, we want to go further from there and see if we're methylating those well. Because if you don't methylate these well, then this 4-hydroxyestrogen is free to create 4-hydroxyestrogen DNA adducts. So this is 4-hydroxyestrogen, and this is a piece of DNA. And so you can see that that creates a complex, and where that came from is from DNA. It actually damages DNA, and when your body fixes that, then you, if you create some errors, then it becomes essentially carcinogenic. So that's where the carcinogenic potential of these estrogen 
metabolites comes from. So again, we want to protect against that. Why? Because if you look at this study, uh, really revealing here that women at high risk for breast cancer and women with breast cancer, they make a whole lot more of these DNA addicts than do the healthy control. So we want to be able to look at those to identify women. You know, for example, there, these women don't have a lot of risk factors for breast cancer. But if you look at this woman right here, for whatever reason, she makes a lot of those DNA addicts. So for someone like that, we want to make sure that she's pushing her estrogen down that good pathway and that she's methylating those estrogens well to protect herself as much as you can against that DNA damage. So let's talk about methylation. What is methylation? Methylation is simply taking a hydroxyestrogen and converting it into something less reactive. So if you look at these two individuals, these are two sets of results. So we're taking two hydroxyestrogen and we're methylating it to two methoxyestrogen. So I picked these two because look at their two methox, two hydroxy, 7.4 and 7.4. They're identical, right? But the person on the top makes a good deal of the methoxy, whereas this person does not. So if you look at their relative rates of methylation, this person's high and this person's low. And again, that is going to come into play uh, in terms of how well we're protecting ourselves against the harmful effects of estrogen, which is particularly important when you've got a premenopausal woman or a woman making a good amount of estrogen or a woman on HRT. Uh, it's still somewhat relevant for postmenopausal women because we'd still like to favor that good estrogen, but it's even more relevant when you have women with lots of circulating estrogen. We want to make sure those are going down a good pathway. So again, this is uh, a woman that we, this, the case that we looked at before, this is a woman who ended up having an ablation because she just makes so much estrogen. Uh, um, and so what you can do, again, is as you take DIM, you're going to upregulate this pathway. So if she was to test again on DIM, she would probably be more up in this region or you know, maybe hopefully way out in here. And what you'd also see is estrone will come down, uh, estradiol will come down. And so uh, you know, people I've had on DIM, uh, those numbers have come down by about half. So that's something to think about. For a woman like this, it's a really positive effect. It's also something that you want to be cautious of when we're looking at people who are relatively estrogen deficient. Because if you look at a woman like this, she's on DIM. If you look at her 2-hydroxyestrogen, it's normal, but that's at the expense of the E1 and the E2, meaning she would probably be up in the low normal part of the reference range for her estrogen. Now, yes, her distribution of estrogen is very favorable in that she makes a lot of the 2-hydroxy relative to the other metabolites, but that's something that you have to think about sometimes uh, when you've got someone who's on the verge of estrogen deficiency, you can actually induce estrogen deficiency. So we need to be testing people to know what are your estrogen levels in terms of your primary estrogens, and then what do your metabolites look like so that we know how to properly properly treat people. Some people need estrogen, some people don't. Some people need estrogen and DIM, some people need DIM alone, uh, and it just depends, and you really don't know what these patterns look like until you test somebody.